it is now time for a review. We have covered the history of the long 20th century from the acceleration of the pace of technical and economic growth in 1870 up until the end of the age of social democracy in the 1970s, when the world is about to take its neoliberal turn. Thus, now is a time to go through a review of the course in a nutshell so far, what we have covered and what perhaps some of the implications are. Our story begins, our story really begins back in 1870 or so with the crossing of the watershed boundary that separated the long Malthusian age in which humanity had fallen with the invention of agriculture from the age of modern economic growth, which has carried us to a much richer and I think much more civilized society. You see, from 1500 to 1770, the techno rate of technological improvement in humanity, um, the value of the stock of ideas about how to manipulate nature and organize humans that had been discovered, developed, and deployed in the world economy, um, that had been growing at about, say, 0.2%, 0.15% per year. But population then had been growing at 0.3% per year worldwide. And so people had access to better technology, yes, slowly improving better technology, but also slowly diminishing farm sizes. And the net effect was that humanity made little, if any, progress in terms of getting a better standard of living to the typical working class or even middle class person in the world economy. Then, starting around 1770, we have the Industrial Revolution begin to take off. Worldwide, the pace of growth of the ideas stock triples from about 0.15 to about 0.45% per year. And in what was to become the global north, in the circle of economies, say, within 300 miles of the port of Dover on the southeastern corner of England, the pace of technological progress discovered, developed, and deployed was perhaps twice as great, perhaps 0.5%. 9% per year. But worldwide, population grew at 0.55% you know, per year, so that there was, me, there was a little improvement. Don't get me wrong. Um, if we want to think of the pre-industrial, um, pre-commercial revolution world as having a typical standard of living of about $900 per year, what the, Un what the United Nations and the World Bank would call dire poverty. Well, maybe by 1770, we were up to 1000 or $1,100 per year as the typical standard of living. And by 1870, we were up to $1,300. Um, certainly, people were living better. But because they were living better, they were also having more children, and more children were surviving. The rate of population growth was about 0.55% per year, which means that, you know, um, at most, maybe one-third of a percentage point per year was the rate of increase of productivity per capita and per worker that could be supported by that technological progress at that, uh, with that amount of declining farm size. But then come 1870, the rate of technological growth worldwide quadruples. The coming of the Industrial Research Lab of the Modern Corporation and of full globalization boosts the rate at which we develop, deploy, and discover new technologies up to more than 2% per year. Enough that if population were stable, that our standards of living would double every 36 years. That rate of technological progress brings with it enormous economic change, great creative destruction, and that creative destruction has powerful political and sociological consequences. Um, so in 1870, humanity crosses the boundary between watersheds that gets us to the valley of modern economic growth. And then from 1870 to 1914, we have what people at the time and in retrospect thought of as economic El Dorado, as a belle epoque, 
as a world in which civilization was advancing, people were becoming richer, um, the world was becoming more civilized, more democratic, more peaceful, at a pace never before seen. And then it all falls apart between 1914 and 1939. World War I. The failure after World War I of reconstruction to get the world economy back on a fast, stable, equitable growth track. The Great Depression. The coming of World War II in both Europe and in the Pacific. Lots of people concluding that the old semi-classical, semi-liberal order on which humanity had built its attempts to deal with the rapid pace of technological progress that began in 1870, that could no longer serve, and we needed a new system, a very different system. And so from 1914 to, um, well, to 1945 in some respects, but all the way up to 1990, the end of the Cold War and others, we had the duel of the systems. Would there be a return to semi-classical, semi-liberalism, the system that had run the world before 1914? Would people resort to fascist alternatives or to really existing socialist alternatives? Would something else be cobbled together? Those questions were asked and answered in the bloody and genocidal abattoirs that were so much of the world between 1914 and 1945, and in some places up until 1990. But after 1945, after 1945, the Global North at least settled into an institutional configuration that we call social democracy. Market economies, yes, but regulated by democratic polities as well. Um, and the market economy as regulated by democratic policies has a great deal of progressive taxation and income distribution to soften the edges of you know, inequality and lead the market system to do more than simply try to satisfy the desires of a few rich with everyone else doing catch as catch can. Also, a strong belief that government needed to control externalities you know, that it was not the case that the market gaveth, the market taketh away, blessed be the name of the market, but the market needed to be pointed in the right direction. And the Keynesian commitment to full employment above all. Those things made the world between 1945 and 1975 grow faster than it ever had before and made people conclude that there was now an institutional configuration that worked for the world economy as a whole, at least in the global north. And the global south undergoes different and you know, less hopeful vicissitudes, but it also grows between 1945 and 1975. But then comes discontent, then comes unhappiness, then comes the inflation of the 1970s of the productivity slowdown, and the world takes the neoliberal turn. If this were the full course in a nutshell, I would go on to describe neoliberalism, but we have not yet gotten there, given where we are in this course right now. Before I jump into the main thread of the course, however, let me do a small detour with respect to the learning process. How do we learn? One way to think of it is that we learn when we argue with other people who know more than we can. And so the ideal of the education process is to get the student arguing with the teacher. A person at one end of the log, a student, Socrates at the other end, Socrates asking questions and eliciting answers and leading the student to knowledge, or at least the knowledge of their great ignorance. But there are very few Socrateses and there are very many students. How do we substitute um, for the missing Socrates? Well, I think that a good way to think of educational technologies is that ultimately those are successful are those that lead individuals to mimic those educational processes within their own brains. That they need somehow to spin up a subterring instantiation of Socrates inside their own minds and argue with it. The question is, how is that going to be done? 
The whole apparatus of the university, in some sense, exists to do that, um, to get people to spin up subterring instantiations of Socrates or whoever their teacher is supposed to be in their brains and get them to talk and argue with them. And one of the principal tools that we use to do this, well, are books. Somewhat ironically, Socrates himself did not like books. He thought books were a pale and completely inadequate substitute for an actual teacher. On the other hand, for Niccolo Machiavelli, living 2,000 years later, his books were of the essence. He did not need to have as his teacher the Roman historian Titus Livius. Rather, he could go with him to his study and there for three hours converse with Titus Livius and get as much out of it as if he had had Livy himself in the room to teach him. What is it that allows some of us to actually take books or other educational technologies and use them to their full benefit. Um, use them to spin up a Socrates in their minds. Um, what, keeps, um, what keeps others from being able to do so? In this respect, I think you should try to become like Machiavelli rather than Socrates, and I think that Berkeley will be a success only if you successfully manage to do so. Before 1870, we had a world in which technological progress, discovered, developed, and deployed, was, by our standards at least, completely glacial. After 1870, up until 2010, we have a doubling of human global technological capacities discovered, developed, and deployed every 35 years or so. After 2010, um, after 2010, it looks like things become different. It looks like we have a new story. We have the stalled recovery from the Great Depression of 2008 and 2009. We have a slowdown in growth, at least in the global north, far below the average pace of 1870 to 2010. We continue to have system destabilizing waves of political and cultural challenges of cultural anger, and we have new challenges dealing with cultural anger, dealing with global warming, um, chief among them, that the institutions, at least the institutions of the global north, are completely unable to deal with. After 2010, perhaps the long 20th century is over and we have a different story. Before 1870, we have a different story. In between, we have the story of the long 20th century, 1870 to 2010 by far the most consequential century of human history, maybe the most consequential century humanity will ever see. During so, humanity goes from poverty to at least potential wealth. Over 1870 to 2010, our technological capabilities deployed into the world economy multiply 21 and a half fold, our population multiplies sixfold, our prosperity multiplies ninefold. Keys to it, the keys that unlocked this cornucopia, were the industrial research lab, the modern corporation, and full globalization. Add to those the property order and limited government, and add to those science and technology based upon coal and steam and the development of machinery, and we have the world of 1870 to 2010 in which technology produces economic change, which produces overwhelming waves of creative destruction, which then the polity and the sociology have to figure out how to handle, and sometimes figure out how to handle very, very badly indeed. Um, witness the Nazi Party Nuremberg rally of 1934 at the bottom of this particular slide. One would have thought that this move from a world of Malthusian near-starvation poverty to one in which people have ten times, um, have ten times the standard of living and the productivity level that they had back in the old agrarian age, that that would allow us for a world of utopia. Um, yet it did not. And the question is, why not? Um, Friedrich von, Hayek, um, Friedrich von Hayek thought that all good that could be accomplished had to be accomplished by the market alone. Um, the market giveth, the market taketh away, blessed be the name of the market. 
Just as St. Paul had said that all that was good could be accomplished by faith alone, for von Hayek it was the market alone, and you dared not ask the market to do more, or anyone to do more. If you asked for any form of social justice, you would wind up destroying the ability of the market to do the good it could do, which was to create prosperity. Others, others thought differently. Karl Polanyi, in the bottom left of the slide, thought that people wanted not only property rights, but rights to community, to income, to employment security, rights to social justice, rights to where they were equal being treated equally, and also rights to treat their unequals unequally. The fact that the market would not produce this would only produce prosperity accompanied by creative destruction. Um, basically, as Polanyi put it, this market tried to destroy society, and society would not stand for that. You had society's reaction. It might be fascist, it might be socialist, it might be something else, it might be good, it might be bad, but society could react. And at least carrying our story up until 1975, society has done best at managing the market, and the market has done best at promoting technology and wealth, when the institutions um, are those that I would describe as a shotgun marriage of Polanyi's concerns to von Hayek's insight, all blessed by John Maynard Keynes's strong concern for prioritizing full employment. What did people expect the year 2000 or so to bring when they first, after the generation of 1870, saw the possibility of technology finally winning the Malthusian race against population and creating a world of abundance, a world of prosperity, a world in which people had more than enough. Um, Pre-industrial history, you know, it had brought miraculous technologies, but these miraculous technologies were developed only very, very slowly, and there was time for higher population to offset them. Miraculous technologies led to increasing living standards, which led to more babies surviving and under conditions of high infant mortality, given parents' desire to have at least some of their children outlive them. That produced higher population, which produced greater resource scarcity, which pushed the typical standard of living back down again. Predation. Figuring out how to steal stuff from people and then hold on to it was a drag on entrepreneurship. In fact, was the focus um, on entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship was not focused on technological development and deployment, but rather on resource extraction and predation. And in such a world, let alone the other lacks, technological progress was bound to be slow. But then comes the Industrial Research Lab, the modern corporation and full globalization, in the context of a market economy with secured property rights and modern science and technology, produces the long 20th century. 70% of humanity lived below $900 per year in dire poverty, you know, below $2.50 a day or so in 1870. Less than 9% um, lives below $2.50 a day today. Today, there is more than enough. Even the Global South is very rich compared to the pre-world 20th century world. And yet, and yet, no triumphalist utopian progress narrative appears to be sustainable. We have not taken our technological power and, built, um, and managed to build a utopia. Part of this is the problem of distribution. Um, that is, when distribution is carried out by the mammon of unrighteousness that is the market economy, it will not produce equitable growth or utopia unless very carefully tuned. But there are other reasons as well. And I think it's important to take a techno-economic, a biosociological, and a national political view of the long 20th century as well. And do not think that the fact that the long 20th century saw humanity escape from Malthusian poverty into relative abundance, you know, was it all foreordained. Certainly back in 1870, British polymath John Stuart Mill did not see 
Business as usual did not see a continuation of the current trends as he saw them, form producing a world of abundance. Instead, he saw technology advancing, yes, but technology not advancing fast enough to outrun growing population, and so the typical human continuing to live the same life of drudgery and imprisonment as humans had before. Fast forward a generation, fast forward or half a generation, to utopian New England thinker Edward Bellamy in his book Looking Backward. He expects the year 2000 to bring about you know, a real utopia of abundance. And of all the things he can mention in his utopia of abundance, the thing that he spends time in his badly written utopian novel on is the ability of you to call up one of four, any one of four live orchestras playing in your city at a particular moment and listen to it on the speakerphone. That, for him, attains the limit of human felicity. And yet our technological powers and abundant wealth so far outstrip the imaginings of Edward Bellamy that it's not even funny. And yet I know of no one who would say that our world is anywhere close to Bellamy's utopia. So then let me recap the grand narrative. Um, five big ideas about the history of the long 20th century, 1870 to 2010. First, um, history from 1870 to 2010 was overwhelmingly economic. Science and technology, the de discovery, development, and deployment of technologies that double humanity's technological capability every generation or so. The creative destruction that that creates, that, that in turn generates, and then political and sociological reactions to and attempts to manage that creative destruction process. That is the core of history from 1870 to 2010. Now, before 1800 or so, history was not even substantially economic. Yes, there was technological progress, but it was very slow, and slow population growth was enough to offset it. The standard of living of the peasants and the craftsmen was the same old, same old Malthusian near-subsistence poverty. The doings of the middle and upper classes, you know, yes, there was technological progress of various kinds, but it was still the same old, the same old battle for figuring out how to extract resources from the peasantry, how then to maintain a hold on the resources you had, and how to think of things in a way to justify your having so much more than others. Between 1800 and 1870, history became more economic, but I would still say it was not primarily economic, because the race against Malthus had not been won. The Malthusian devil was still an overwhelmingly important part. And so as a result, back then, history was primarily religious or intellectual or political or cultural. It is only since 1870 that history has been primarily economic. For it is after 1870, with the coming of the Industrial Research Lab, the modern corporation, and full globalization, that the rate of increase of human technological capabilities has reached 2% per year, doubling every generation, and material wealth has exploded beyond all previous imagining with associated creative destruction. All that is solid melts into air, as Friedrich Engels and Karl Marx wrote, or perhaps the German they wrote is better translated as all existing orders and institutions are steamed away. The consequences? Health, long life, societal transformation, economic transformation, and their consequences, feminism, inclusion, etc. But big idea four, that nevertheless an awful lot went wrong as society reacted to the creative destruction of the market. Tyranny, inequality, and depression. Nevertheless, a lot went right. Um... So given that a lot went right, given that we are so much richer than our predecessors, where, in fact, is our utopia? Let me briefly underscore all the things that have gone badly wrong. 
tyrannies, wealth gulfs, and mismanagement. Hitler, Mao, and Stalin, and their little brothers. Maybe something more needs to be said about thing because about them because the peculiar thing was that most of these tyrannies, they were powered by ideas about what the proper economic organization of the world should be. Stalin, Mao, and also in his way Hitler, wanted to create the economy on which they thought they could build their particular version of utopia, and were willing to create and then wade through rivers of blood in order to do this. Um, and you know, one usually thinks of ideas about economic organization as relatively technical, and not the kind of thing to get that excited or violent about. What we've also seen since 1870 has been wealth gulfs of a magnitude previously unbelievable. Um, that pre 1870 societies simply were not rich enough for modern degrees of wealth inequality, those we see in our second Gilded Age, to have been barely possible. And then we see failures of managing the system by the governments, um, of which mass unemployment is perhaps the most striking example. And we have Karl Polanyi's insights into the things that have gone wrong, how the market economy recognizes only property rights and subjects the world to creative destruction, and only if you have valuable property rights can you protect themselves. But people think they have rights to land, labor, and finance. And by land, Polanyi meant a stable community and a community in which was protected against negative externalities produced. Um, by the churning up of the environment by resources in the pursuit of wealth. And by labor, Polanyi meant a right to a stable income commensurate with what one thinks one deserves, which also means appropriate income and status differentials vis-a-vis -vis others. Unequals should be treated unequally. And finance, you know, that the stability of one's job and one's business should not depend on the incomprehensible decisions of financiers from thousands of miles away. And yet the market economy offered you none of those. And so while Polanyi said a stable society, in fact, a society at all, um, in fact, society at all, um, that people will demand that the market be made for man, not man for the market, but instead the reactions of the system and of its ideologues led by Friedrich von Hayek is that the market giveth, the market taketh away, blessed be the name of the market, and attempts to constrain the market, and attempts to constrain the market in a non-destructive way, are at the heart of much that has gone very badly wrong, that went very badly wrong in the long 20th century. In the background over 1870 to 2010, we have our estimates of the accumulating technological power of humanity. And we also have the rising distinction between the global north and the global south. Our technological growth estimates are 2% per year on average from 1870 to 2010 in the world as a whole, doubling every 35 years. And the global north, um, well, it really starts out as the, Glover, as the Dover Circle or so. Those economies, those societies, those polities with headquartered within 300 miles of Dover. They then engage from 1500 on in a remarkable, remarkable episode of conquest, settlement, exploitation, and then the emulation of their institutions by others who think that they have a good thing going and want in on it. Um, Along with this comes a great deal of resource engrossment, of engrossment of the rest of the resources by the Dover Circle that becomes the Global North, considered as a culture area, imperialism and neo-imperialism. You know, the Global North was maybe 2.5% of the world's population in 800. It is 11% of the world's population today. It has spread out from the Dover Circle to, well, from Perth in Australia all the way up to kind of Newfoundland in Canada and over to Europe in the western half of Europe. Um, it was to some degree the leading edge of the world, perhaps in 1500, with maybe a 1.2 to 1 
edge in income per capita then, all that was mostly because of institutions that limited fertility rather than technological creativity. Its edge in living standards was maybe 1.4 to 1 in 1770, maybe 2.3 to 1 in 1870, and divergence has continued since. So it is now 3.9 to 1 or so is the edge of the global north over the rest in now in 2010. Let's look at one of our three key drivers of the long 20th century, starting in the late 1800s. Globalization, with 1870 as the inflection point. As of 1870, had the Industrial Revolution that had been going on for a century, had it raised the standard of living or lightened the toil of the working class in England, the country at the center of the Industrial Revolution, or indeed any place else? The answer seems to be no. Why not? Because of Malthusian forces. Population explosion from the fact that there had been a little gain in income per capita relative to previous Malthusian stagnation and thus far smaller farm sizes offset what technological improvements there had been before 1870, at least as far as the standard of living of the working class was concerned. But in the years around 1870, the pace of global growth in ideas discovered, developed, and deployed, nearly quintupled, um, and has continued to grow faster in the global north than elsewhere since 1870. The principal cause being the modern corporation and its industrial research labs that routinized and rationalized the processes of discovering and developing and then developing and deploying new productive ideas. But the secondary cause was globalization, a globalization of goods trade using railroads and iron hold steamships, the globalization of people through migration, the globalization of communications via the telegraph. All of these made it possible to deploy new technologies, not just in your town, in your country, in your language area, in your culture area, but worldwide. Of key importance in dividing the world after 1870 between a global north and a global south and creating the world we have was international migration. Nobel Prize winning economist of Princeton, teaching at Princeton from Santa Lucia, W. Arthur Lewis. It was he who taught me that a hundred million people left their continents of origins between 1870 and 1913. 70 million of them permanently, 30 million of them to return with some with success in the form of money or with failure back to their original locations. Why? Because after 1870, it took only nine days to go from Liverpool to New York, while it had taken a month in 1800. After 1870, it took one and a half months wages for an unskilled European worker to move across oceans to double your pay and your children's pay when you do so. And so 50 million people from Europe and 50 million people from Asia. But the people from Asia, they were kept out of Europe and of the high productivity region, temperate zone regions of European settlement. They were channeled to tropical regions making tropical goods. And so what you had was an enormous increase in the supply of tropical goods from plantations, which depressed the prices that countries selling those tropical goods could get on the world market and hobbled the growth of their middle class to serve as a market for domestic manufacturers so that they could get the process of industrialization and technological deployment going in their own countries. Um, Migration also created something else. Migration also created exceptional America. That the long 20th century was overwhelmingly an American century because it was migration, global migration, that gave America a population, a full citizen population outstripping that of either the British or the German Empire. And it was because of that larger full citizen population at a global north standard of productivity and 
product of productivity and production and living standards. Um, that made the United States the country to emulate throughout the long 20th century and also gave it the geopolitical military economic heft to make of the 20th century an American century rather than a German or a second British century. One of those who noted exactly how much the world was becoming an American century was a Russian emigre named Lev Bronstein, who wound up in New York in 1916. He wound up in New York involuntarily. He was regarded as a political danger and was thus exiled from every single European country. You see, the name that he became known as is Leon Trotsky, Trotsky being an alias he picked up from one of his jailers in the Ukrainian city of Odessa. Um, he was overwhelmed by the prosperity of the United States then, especially its technological marvels. But he was a Russian, he was a follower of Vladimir Lenin, he thought his life's task was to make the really existing socialism, the communist revolution in Russia, and so when the Russian Revolution broke out, he returned to Russia. Having had, he wrote, no time to more than catch the general life rhythm of the monster that was in New York. But, he said, he left for Europe with the feeling of a man who has only had a peek into the furnace where the future is being forged. For it was America um, that the 20th century, the long 20th century, was most itself. Science fiction writer William Gibson has a line about how the future is already here. It is just not evenly distributed around the world. Well, throughout the 20th century, it was much more in the United States than elsewhere. That science had reached critical mass and from it had sprung engineering. But that quickly became much more so in the United States. Um, and all of the engineering subdisciplines, including the management of human resources and of organizations, had their flourishing in the United States. The United States had the most highly developed liberal and democratic political order. And from it, and from it there sprung a national economy to be managed by the nation. And then the global market economy. And from engineering and the market and the democratic polity that attempts to govern it, since 1870, from that springs pretty much everything else. It is that accelerated pace at which science advances and at which the industrial research labs then turn science into technology, not as or not just as the acts of individual genius, but as rationalized and routinized enterprises by groups that themselves have a fine division of labor. And as the modern corporation then turned those engineering ideas into products and processes and develop and deploy them. And as the fact that it is a globalized world means the deployment is worldwide. That is what underpins all else that happens in the 20th century. Before 1870, ideas growth was not fast enough to outrun fecundity. Um, was not fast enough to create a society rich enough to trigger the demographic transition. After 1870, ideas growth was fast enough to trigger the demographic transition to what we now think will be zero population growth, and also fast enough to outrun the population explosion while the population was going on. Um, and that amount of creative destruction driven by technology in the economy vastly, vastly outstripping even what we'd seen in the Industrial Revolution century between 1770 and 1870. That was at the heart of 18, the history of 1870 to 2010. The world had crossed this watershed boundary in 1870. And so from 1870 up until 1914, you had technological and economic growth associated creative destruction, and with it political and sociological change, and frantic attempts to management the change, at a pace never before seen in human history. The result was to create a world that by 1914, at least in the global north, was extraordinarily and unbelievably rich by the standards of any previous era, an economic El Dorado, and one that was surprisingly modern. You know, the heavy industries were there, 
coal, oil, machinery, metallurgy, electricity, internal combustion, organic chemicals, etc. In 1913, Britain burned 194 million tons of goal, coal. Within shouting distance, um, the total coal equivalent energy consumption of Britain today is less than three times its 1913 level. Um, in 1913, United States, citizens of the United States, um, the average person traveled 350 miles by rail. Um, not the same order of magnitude, but not that many orders of magnitude behind the 3,000 miles per average person that U.S. citizens traveled via airplanes back before the coronavirus plague arrived. This was economic El Dorado, according to the then young British economist John Maynard Keynes, writing retrospectively in 1919. The chaining up of the Malthusian devil and the extraordinary, extraordinary creation of a world in which for the first time Typical standards of living were rising fast enough for people to see that the world today had twice the technological capability that it had had a generation before. Um, and yet in other ways, it was not yet that modern. Agriculture and landlords were still dominant over most of the world. Agriculture was largely unmechanized. You know, nitrogen artificial fertilizers were still just a gleam in chemist Fritz Haber's eye. People still worked like dogs in the South Pacific on islands off the coast of South America to mine the products of avian defecation and then ship the guano back to Europe as fertilizer. More than half of Americans were still working on the farm. Only Britain and Belgium had less than half of their labor force in agriculture. There was still the social and political dominance of landlord aristocrats over all others. Remember, as late as 1941, um, when the armies of Nazi Germany, then the third most advanced in dust major industrial power in the world, invade the Soviet Union. 80% of their military units have their supply wagons pulled by horses rather than having trucks. Um, or tanks to kind of get things from the railroad railheads up to where the armies actually 